This podcast is about real estate with intelligence. It is pulling the sword from the stone. This podcast is about that unique balance in real estate, that balance between technological intelligence and our emotional intelligence and the transactions and interactions with one another in the real estate process. That's why we're inviting expert guests, people who are knowledgeable and bring different perspective. Join me in exploring this fascination, the look behind the scenes of technological advancement and how it's interacting with people's decisions in real estate. So, Chris, welcome to the Real Estate with Intelligence podcast. Uh, this is an exciting day to have you here. Um, I can't wait to share with uh, our audience your list of credentials, the level of intelligence you bring from both an emotional and an actual IQ standpoint to the business and the industry. It's so diverse. You're so well studied and uh, experienced in this uh, field. And yet this is not the first time we've been on a podcast together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is the first time we're hosting you on our own podcast, Real Estate with Intelligence. Uh, yet we've participated in one together at, uh, previous to this. And it'll be interesting to compare notes to see how you like uh, our performance uh, in the show and also yeah. um, in what comes out of this podcast versus our, our former one. Uh, Chris, you have so many different credentials in real estate. You are a licensed broker. You've got a ton of certifications. You've got a master's in business. Sh share with all of us the plethora of things that make you a true expert in your field. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, first of all. Uh, yeah, you're moving on up from uh, guest to host. So the student becomes <laughs> the master now, right? Um, but yeah, this will tie into, a, um, I, I think some of what we'll talk about later as well, but my whole mentality in my career has been um, learn as much as you can and do as much as possible and that'll only benefit you. And I've always been curious in a lot of different areas. So I started off as a real estate agent, uh, worked my way into a broker's license. I ended up uh, getting a master's uh, finance certification from University of Texas. I got my project management professional certification later on as part of my real estate development career. And then uh, as I moved into commercial management, I have my community managers associations license. Um, and so all, all of these credentials um, have been a result of me being curious in different areas of my career and wanting to learn more. And uh, ultimately, it's, it's led me to be a kind of Swiss army knife uh, in the real estate industry. I like it. You know, I would say, you know, a, a Swiss army knife on steroids because you're not just multifunctional, you're actually really good with every one of your tools and and background and certifications. Tell me, when you've dipped your toe into curiosity into different parts of real estate, have you found any any pools that you haven't liked to dip in with your curiosities? Um, I started down the path of getting learning uh, accounting and starting to think about maybe getting my CPA license at one point because I'd gone through all the business courses in college and it was one more year of classes and I could have that that CPA designation as well. But once I got into the actual nuts and bolts of bookkeeping, I, I, I love the finance picture, kind of thinking big picture about how the numbers come together, but the actual day to day. Uh, that went into the CPA education was not for me. So yeah, that's that's something that I stepped away from pretty pretty early on after I started it. So with with your long list of credentials, are you done with the credentials, or are there more that you're curious to to, to explore and achieve? Yeah, there's plenty more. Um, there's always additional levels of of where you're at. So like I said, I have my community association manager's license, but there is a professional uh, community association manager's license. So it's the next step up from that. There's also a uh, real property uh, manager's license. There's a uh, certified property manager's license. There's all of these various de designations where, again, um, starting in residential and then moving to commercial, I've found that uh, 
by getting these designations, you provide yourself with some credibility when you're talking to clients and with others in the industry. So yeah, the learning is always going to continue and I'm always going to be pursuing uh, another designation or, or credential. So uh, also this year you added um, a unique designation and credential to your list, which is not one you went to school for, but there's more of the school of hard knocks waiting yeah. <laughs> for us all out there, which is you're an entrepreneur, you're the managing partner and the CEO of Reacts Commercial Real Estate Services and Brokerage. Um, tell us a little bit about Reacts, you know, why it makes sense for you and what you're pursuing in the future with that. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that another credential that did not come from school is, is father. So <laughs> oh, that's right. Um, as as we even harder one. <laughs> yeah, um, so one that I, I neglected to mention, but it's probably the most important. And uh, yeah, so Reax is a real estate advisory and consulting services is what it stands for. It's a commercial property management company and brokerage. And I had started off with you in the residential industry uh, 12, 13 years ago. And my very circuitous route uh, through the real estate industry led me to uh, create relationships and pick up these designations as I went along. And that led me to uh, becoming, uh, getting into conversations with an owner of a longstanding commercial real estate company that had been around for 30 years, was well respected in the industry. He, um, like many of the boomer generation, uh, is looking for a way to uh, seamlessly transition out of his company and his legacy that he's built. And because of the relationship I had with him and my relationship with his son, who was part of the, the team, uh, the opportunity came up where he was hoping to transition the company off to, to us. Um, with my relationship with you and everything that you've built at Chambers Theory, uh, it seemed like a natural fit to kind of marry the the, the two uh, uh, companies together, the the longstanding commercial real estate company and the up and coming, quickly growing residential firm that that you've developed. Uh, so that opportunity came about at the end of last year uh, and went into effect early 2023. It's been a fantastic learning experience. You always think as an employee and even as a, a high contributor to a company that you know what it takes and what the leader of the company is feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. But you truly don't know until you're in that position and you are responsible for making sure, I mean, at the, at the base of it, making sure that people are getting paid every two weeks, right? But then on top of that, uh, just the everyday, not just moving the ball along, but picking up the momentum of that ball. And it is uh, just a whole completely new mindset for me. Um, like I said and, and touched on before, the designations, the skills, the learning has all helped in me having the knowledge to run that. But the mindset is the biggest change. It's kind of like becoming a parent. Nothing can truly yes. prepare you for what really happens. Yeah. <laughs> no matter how many books you read about being a parent or certifications you take in business school, um, being an entrepreneur and a CEO is just a different thing than than the practice yes. or the study. I know I told my, my wife that we should just get a new puppy at the same time as well and just <laughs> just knock out all the- uh, Rip the band-aid off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you, know, you are someone that I've always seen as living with intention. Um, you plan out things well in advance. You- um, again, you know, bring so much intelligence to the real estate space, both emotional and just pure IQ and knowledge and experience and know-how. With someone with your level of competency, have you had any moments where you're like, oops, that was dumb, or I didn't plan that one out really well? Like any like stupid human stories that for someone who's so smart, like show us that you're still human. Yeah, plenty. Uh, it happens, <laughs> happens on a day-to-day -day basis. I, and I'll give you one from uh, just a few days ago. It was Mother's Day. It was my my wife's first Mother's Day. I wanted to make it special. And she loves strawberry cake, so uh, strawberry cupcakes. So I was going to do it. She was out with her mom and sister, and I made a goal. I'm going to knock out these strawberry cupcakes before she gets home. They're all going to be nicely arranged on the kitchen table when she gets back. And I went to the grocery store, uh, called for strawberries to mix in. I got frozen strawberries come back, read the recipe. I'm making it freeze dried strawberries. I'm like, okay, well maybe that's the same thing. When you Google it, it's not. So I'm like, all right, I'll go back to the grocery store. Went back to the grocery store, 
pick up strawberries again. I come back, they have their sugar coated dry freeze strawberries and I come back and I'm like, okay, well, is that going to make it too sweet? Like, what if I just cut down on the sugar that I put in the recipe? Nope, that's not going to work. So then I go back again, third time to the grocery store and they don't have plain freeze dried strawberries. So I try to figure out what I'm going to do. I'm walking down the cereal aisle and bam, I see special K or honey bunches of oats with freeze dried strawberries. I pick out seven boxes. I'm like, I'll just pick them out. So I go home have seven boxes mm. of strawberry cereal on my kitchen counter, picking out the freeze dried strawberries uh, into a bowl. And of course the three trips to the grocery store delayed me. My wife walks in the door. I'm not even halfway done with the recipe. And she's like, what the heck is going on here? <laughs> Needless to say, she being the wonderful wife that she is, helped me pick out the freeze dried strawberries from the cereal. And we finished the strawberry cupcakes together. So uh, uh, it, it's got a happy ending, but I gotta, gotta, gotta say, I actually feel a lot of relief because you're always two steps ahead. You're always <laughs> so well planned out and to know that, yeah, even Chris Harold makes, you know, some snafus in the planning process every uh, once in a while. And yet you were still able to adapt. <laughs> so, um, do you foresee a future where artificial intelligence is going to help people oh. cook better? Uh, I would hope so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I saw an app recently where you punch in what ingredients you have and it'll pop out a recipe for you. So I'll have to play around with that a little bit. <laughs> so obviously artificial intelligence is a big hot topic. Um, you are very forward leaning and we are very forward leaning in our innovation process and the technological platforms we use for our real estate services companies. Yeah. Um, what are you seeing? What are you afraid of? What are you not even worried about with artificial intelligence in terms of meshing with your world in property management and brokerage? Yeah, I think there's a, a big, uh, a lot of noise around open AI and the whole chat GPT and everything. And it's, um, it is amazing what it can do if uh, I'm sure you've messed around with it. But uh, I mean, there's so much information out there and to be able to consolidate all that in a way that um, can be used in the way that OpenAI is doing it is, is amazing. Um, and just focusing on this specific example, um, I don't, I'm not too worried about AI disrupting the real estate industry and the way that we operate in it because there's so much that has to do with interpersonal relationships that AI is not going to be able to solve for. Uh, sure, maybe the online interfaces and the uh, actual transactional um, model of buying and selling houses or managing properties may change, but there's always going to be someone who owns that house that wants to talk to another person that they trust and that they know that they know is going to care for that house. And one of the big uh, aspects of Chambers Theory is having a capacity to care. Can AI care the way that a human can? I don't. I don't necessarily think so. So uh, that's just something where, again, it's some people view it as a transaction, but other people view it as their their home, and it's something that they're going to return to. It's something that they have memories in that they're sentimental value to. And uh, technology is never going to replace the, the level of care or, or the feelings that go into that transaction. Yeah, I like that dichotomy of transaction versus home. Yeah. And th like, there's such a, a gap and a distinction between the two. And yet, you know, so often in business, we see the, the transaction review in business. And what's really happening behind that transaction is, is this emotional aspect and psychological aspect for people. Um, and hence, real estate with intelligence is, you know, how, you know, how are we looking at things from a, a, a technologically intelligent way or artificially intelligent way, a business intelligent way versus an emotionally intelligent way and and where do those worlds collide um, yeah. and how do we leverage the power of all of those things for the ultimate outcome optimizing those outcomes in real estate um, with regards to what you're seeing in commercial brokerage and property management right now you know are there things out there that are there headlines out there that um, you think that are people are paying too much attention to or they're grabbing or, or too much of a magnet headline that it's different than what you're actually seeing in practice? Yeah, I think uh, there's 
nationwide headlines that sometimes misconstrue what the local feel is and what's actually happening in the local market. And one of those being um, uh, these headlines that commercial real estate, especially the office industry, and to some extent, the retail industry is declining because the work from home environment and online shopping. So the work from home environment is uh, reducing the need for office space. So the office asset class is a declining asset class. That's what the headlines are saying. Uh, more people are buying goods online and services online. You don't need brick and mortar stores anymore. So then the retail asset class is declining. And again, that's what the headlines are saying. And um, uh, while um, those are true for several large companies in the in the local market that we're in, I see that uh, there is a different viewpoint of that. And um, the reality is somewhat different. Uh, on a, on a local scale than on the national scale. And in my practice and working on day-to-day -day with small to mid-sized companies and even large companies, uh, there's still a need for office space and still a need for brick and mortar stores. Uh, although the Airbnbs and the Stripes and the WeWorks of the world may be reducing their real estate holdings, there are many companies that still want to meet in person, that still want a um, busy street facing retail outlet that they can interact with customers on. And our vacancy rate at Reax is less than 8% across our whole portfolio. And I think that's a strong testament. And that's that, very different than the headlines. Yeah, very different from the headlines. Yeah. And I think that that's a strong testament. Yeah, people, people want to be in space and um, especially smaller companies and mid-sized companies that want to be together. I'm really enjoying this, that there, there's this fascinating outcome and insights that come with talking to someone who's really sharp, understands their industry. And you, know, you just made this comment like, okay, there's this macroeconomic picture. There's these, these national headlines and it's, um, can be very different than, than the actual experience in the microeconomic environment or the, or the localized. And, you know, again, going back to the conversation about, artificial intelligence and, you know, artificial intelligence is probably pulling massive data. It's looking at things from a global perspective and you could confine some of this into national perspective, but it'd be really hard to get a, a an overarching uh, artificial intelligence program to be looking at things from a micro or maybe not. But, you know, certainly I see that there's a, there is a difference in decision of how you're addressing the sub the same subject yeah. from a local picture versus a national versus a global picture. Yeah, I agree. The um, you know with all the talk of real estate, I you know usually I like to ask a couple of personal questions about our guests first, and I've just been so fascinated by you know knowing how much of the intelligence and the certifications you bring to the space. Um, but one of the things I really like to ask is not just the human story element, but also you know, if you were to pick out a character or a um, in a show or a movie, somebody that you really relate to and like, who would that be for you? You know, like, like who do you really connect with movie or show character wise? <laughs> um, at the risk of sounding too dorky. Uh <laughs> I'm a, I'm a big Harry Potter fan. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and uh, my... Niece is getting into the age where she's starting to read and watch the the Harry Potter books and movies, and we recently watched um, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, and in this movie, Hermione Granger, who's the uh, the overachiever of the bunch, right? Uh, she's coming in, getting straight A's out right off the bat at Hogwarts, right? She decides, hey, I, I can do more. And she goes to her professor and says, hey, I have this extra class load that I want to take. Um, I want to do it, but they overlap with each other. So the professor, I, I don't know why she thought this was a good idea, <laughs> decided to give her a time travel device to a 14-year-old kid. So <laughs> Hermione's traveling back and forth. She's taking double the class load because she has double the time. She's taking one class, flipping the time turner, going back, running to the next class, hoping people don't see her. And ultimately, 
um, it ends up coming back and, and backfiring on her because she's overwhelmed. She has too much to do. She gets burnt out. And uh, ultimately, she uses the time turner to do something good. And it was all with good intentions, right? She wanted to learn more. She wanted to get involved in more extracurricular activities. It was never like, hey, I want to go back in time so that I can, I don't know, kick the boy in the shin who snuffed me <laughs> when he didn't ask me out for the dance or something like that. Um so I, I kind of related to that, and especially now with fatherhood, uh, a new business in Reacts coming on board, um, uh, and, and everything else that you got going on with life, it's just you never find enough time in the day to do what you want. So Whether you have a time machine or not. Well, yes, exactly. <laughs> and I've always felt that if you can be disciplined enough, maybe you can find enough time in even in high school, I was trying to plan days where I was playing basketball with my friends and then going to jam with my band and then spend time with my girlfriend and then eat dinner with my family and whatever. And I would have these jam packed days and my parents would always say like, ah, like, like good for you. But like you sometimes you got to say no to something. And, uh, I've, I've learned that more and more this year is that by trying to say yes to everything, you're inevitably saying no to something else. So, uh, if I, want to be as successful as I can in my business, um, that may mean that I'm cutting out time for my family. Or if I want to prioritize my family and my business, am I then cutting down on my health and not working out as much as I would like to or not sleeping as much as I would like to? So it's just trying to balance those trade-offs. Um, but yeah, seeing Hermione, hey, Hermione got burnt out too. She <laughs> she figured out a way to structure her day around it. And if she can do it, then maybe I can. So, yeah. Well, if, if there's such thing as, as that spell and you find it, please share. Yeah, <laughs> don't worry. Chris, thank you so much for uh, being part of our show. Thank you so much for everything you bring intelligence-wise to the industry, as a leader in the industry, as someone who's innovating in the industry, who brings a different perspective. Um, and who brings a ton of value to clients of our businesses and uh, in the real estate world. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on and everything that you've taught me over the years. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, I need, a, I need a time machine to go back and, and yeah. teach myself some things too. I don't think we'd be uh, working in real estate if we could sell time machine devices, right? <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Great, Chris, thanks. Man. Yeah, thank That's you. Great. This podcast is about real estate with intelligence. It is pulling the sword from the stone. This podcast is about that unique balance in real estate, that balance between technological intelligence and our emotional intelligence and the transactions and interactions with one another in the real estate process. That's why we're inviting expert guests, people who are knowledgeable and bring different perspective. Join me in exploring this fascination, the look behind the scenes of technological advancement and how it's interacting with people's decisions in real estate.